Good morning. As I said earlier, my name is Pastor Rex Dawson. I'm the connection pastor here. What does that mean? That means if you need to talk to somebody, if you need prayer, if you know somebody that's shut in, if you have any needs at all from the pastoral staff, let me know, and they will be taken care of. That is kind of my job. Today we're going to talk about legacy. What does the word legacy mean to anyone? What's here after you die? The dictionary would say valuable gifts passed on from one that is gone. Uh, a valuable gift, a football. Does anybody have other valuable gifts that were left to them? A gold thimble. A gold thimble. Very good. I've got a little vase about that big with flowers on the front of it. My grandmother bought that at the carnival for two cents in 2002, I believe. And I've carried that with me. It's the only thing I have of hers left except her Bible. So, and the Bible's in German. I don't do real good with that Bible. But uh, it is something that was left to me that has meaning. It, I carry that forward. Uh, through all our trials and tribulations, I have kept that one thing because it meant a lot to me. We're going to take a look at someone in the Bible today. We're talking about Genesis 15, 4 to 5. And you can tell me who this is. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside, looked up at the sky, and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall be your offspring. Who are we talking about? Abraham, Abraham correct. Abraham was in his 80s when that word came to him. At that time in, in Bible history, if you didn't have a son, you were looked down on. You were, people felt sorry for you. That first son was the most important thing in your life. That was your legacy. And he didn't have one. By the time he was 85, Sarah, his wife, figured I'm not going to be able to provide what the Lord promised. So her slave, Hagar, slept with Abraham, and Ishmael was born. This happens to all of us. We know God wants us to do something, but waiting on the Lord is not an easy thing to do. Typically, when we force the issue, there's consequences. When he was in his 90s, Sarah got pregnant, and she had a child, Isaac. We have a family here. Sarah hated Hagar. She mistreated her. She loved Isaac. And we have a family that was widely split. Hagar ran away. She had to go away. But the Lord told her also that she would have many, many generations of offspring. So we have two families here, one hating, both hating each other in honesty because Sarah took things in her own hand. Now, I look at this and Abraham's going to have generations of kids, countless as the stars. You don't have to read a lot in the Old Testament to figure out that what Abraham spawned was the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay? All of those children, you don't have to go very far in the Bible to see that all of his kids didn't turn out okay. And it caused division that lasts even into today in the Middle East. Okay? So taking things in your own hands without God's promise have long-term consequences. I've been blessed with my son, Brett, and his wife, Michelle, they were married. My son felt he pretty well had life figured out. Good job going up in the company. He had two boys. They were happy. He had Blake and he had Nikki. Blake was this perfect kid. Smart, straight-A student. Set all of the football records for a running back uh, in Anthem. He just was one of those kids that did everything. That cast a pretty big shadow over 
my next grandson. But he's brilliant. He's got a brain that is unbelievable. When he was five and six, he would build these huge roller coasters through the house, and they worked. When he was 14 years old, he came out to a Standing Stones where Karen and I were at, and I was going to dig a trench through caliche. Anybody know what caliche is? And a little harder than concrete, okay? And I had a big excavator, and he came out and said, can I operate that? And I said, I probably don't think so. He says, well, show me how. He dug a 100-yard-long trench in caliche to the perfect depth, never had a problem. He's just very good at that type of thing. So he's a blessing. Karen and I were in Pasadena, California on New Year's. Actually, a few days before New Year's. We were blessed to be working on a New Year's float. Has anybody ever done that? You ought to try it. It is a kick. You get up and you, you don't sleep much, but you're putting pedals and seeds and things on these beautiful floats that turn out to be masterpieces. We did that, and we were sitting on the corner where the floats come around, and my son called me. Now, my son doesn't call me. That doesn't happen. So I picked up the phone. He said, Dad, I got some news. Don't you love it when somebody does that? Just tell me what you want to tell me. <laughs> Don't make me wait. He said, Michelle's pregnant. And I said, that's wonderful. He says, well, Dad, we didn't want any more kids. I said, well, it's a blessing. Being a grandparent, hey, it was awesome. A month later, the phone rings again, Dad. And I figured, well, Michelle, in her 30s, had a miscarriage. No, twins. We doubled down on grandkids. My son wasn't so excited, but me, I was. Now, when you look at the twins, Zach and Allie, there's something obvious about that. It's A to Z. There was going to be no more. <laughs> Allie's our princess, our girl. She's a dancer. She does six different types of dance, everything from ballet to hip-hop, and she's really into it. Zach lights up the room anytime he walks into it. He's full of life full of mischief, full of everything. God has blessed us with a legacy that we just cannot uh, believe because one son, four grandkids, figure it out. It's wonderful. So let's get a little personal about what we are and who we are. i got a video here. i got a picture here of do we have any Olympic champions here? or any Oscar winners, or extreme sports people. I, I got one right here, yes. Uh, he can walk, actually. That's, that's about it. But... All right. That's better than I do. Okay. I've got a video for you I'd like to have you look at. A couple of them, actually. I am the greatest! Times I have told the clown what round he's going down, and this stump ain't no different. He'll fall in eight to prove that I'm great, and if he keeps talking jive, I'm gonna cut it to five. You don't understand, I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum, which is what I am, let's face it. Has anybody had feelings of either one of those two things? <laughs> I think we all share a little bit. I had an extraordinary experience. I had this and this in one week's time. I had formed a company and I was building a battery product, and that battery product was going to revolutionize the world. In fact, I had a contract. It would literally store enough power to power Timothy's house. I had a Africa villages that were going to use it. At the same point in time, these, these wind farms and solar farms, the problem with them is the energy goes down the line and it has to be used. But I had a storage system where it could be used at peak hours. So even if you had a home solar system, you could save that and store it. There was an international battery conference in Miami, and I couldn't attend it. I had something else to do. And the keynote speaker said, Rex Dawson has the answer to storage. That was Monday. I'm up here. Tuesday, Karen went into work. She'd worked for Allstate Insurance Company for 25 years. 
and they laid her off. They outsourced her department. I should have known it was going to be a bad week. <laughs> Thursday, there was a board meeting. I had investors, I had a board, and my lawyer had arranged a contract so I could build my product in China. And that Thursday, my lawyer and the Chinese stole my company out from under me. Uh, I went from here to I could have been a contender, just like that. The funny thing is, it didn't matter. In fact, God put his hand on us and said, don't worry about it. They wanted me to stay involved in the company, and I walked away. It didn't take two months for them to close shop. But God stayed with Karen and I. Now, we're living in Sacramento, California, and God said, I've got something for you to do. And he brought us to heaven on earth, Wickenburg, Arizona. Now, I don't think we ever would have moved here on our own. I really don't. And believe me, I love it. I love this so much. But it wasn't in my plans. I had plans. I was going to be great. I was going to make a lot of money and do a lot of things for God. That wasn't what God wanted at all. So he slapped me around a bit and brought me out here. And here I am now, blessed. Blessed to be with each of you. Blessed to have this church. Blessed to have a family that is phenomenal. Let's talk about someone else that's blessed. 1 Samuel 16, 12, and 13. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearances and handsome features. The Lord said, Arise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. King David, a child at this time. Understand, Samuel didn't want to do this in the first place. See, Saul was still king, and Samuel pretty well figured Saul would have him killed. God said, go do a banquet with Jesse and bring his sons forward. Elib, his first son, is the natural son to become king. He's tall, he's rugged, he's a soldier, and he's the firstborn. This is tradition. This is what should have happened. But not only did he pass in front of Jesse and God said, or in front of Samuel, and God said no, six other brothers passed in front of him. And God said, no, that's not the one. Samuel said, Jesse, do you have any other kids? Yeah, I've got this kid out in the field taking care of sheep. We won't eat until he gets here. Here's the brother sitting there. He comes in, he gets anointed in front of his brothers. How do you think their relationship went after that? Yeah, it wasn't real good. In fact, if you really get in and look at uh, the story when David killed Goliath, he was just delivering bread for the troops. He wasn't a soldier. In fact, when he put on the armor, he couldn't walk. It was too big. So he took it off. But his brother said, what are you doing here, you egotistical kid? His brothers really didn't like him. But God put his hand on him. The other thing that is important here is the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. Now, David didn't live a perfect life by any stretch of the imagination. He committed murder. But God forgave him. God knew his heart. He knew what he wanted to do, even though he didn't always do it. So God took very good care of David. And he did become king. And he was king for 40 years after Saul died. David's legacy is he had children too. And the first son he loved very much. Anybody know his name? Absalom. Absalom, oh Absalom. Absalom was a son that raised an army against David because he wanted to be king now. Now one of Absalom's traits was he had this beautiful, long, flowing hair. And as he was riding through the thicket, his hair caught in a tree, and he died there. And David would mourn that, by the way, even though Absalom wanted to overthrow him. He had another son who proclaimed himself king. But on that day, David, 1 Kings 2.1, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave charge to Solomon, his son. Solomon God came to and said, ask what you want. 
We figure Solomon's probably 14 years old at this time. He's not very old. 1 Kings 3, 9, and 10. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And the Lord blessed Solomon the rest of his life. Solomon was probably the richest person to live, if you want to take the value of his property at that time. He was super wealthy. He didn't just have people. He taught. He was a teacher. He taught people about animals. He taught people about all the different plants, the good ones and the bad ones. He was a teacher, and he was filled with knowledge. So what a gift this man had. He was unbelievable. The Queen of Sheba came to visit him. Kings and queens from around the world came for his wisdom. Later in life, he summed up what he learned. Ecclesiastes 1.1. The word of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. We're looking for some real meaningful words here. And he said, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. After all these years, after all this path he went down, after building the temple, he saw it as meaningless, all that he had. So the wealth and everything else did not affect him. But later in Ecclesiastes, he comes to this conclusion. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Again, for God will bring every deed to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or bad. So Solomon came to that point in his life. That was his conclusion about what life meant. His legacy was obeying God. That's what his legacy was. That's where he was going with the story. So, the place church. One of the interesting things I found out recently was, in looking at different translations, this massive temple that Solomon built, it was called the place. And this is the place. God dwells in both. The difference is, God dwelled in that one as God. He dwells here as the Holy Spirit in each of our hearts. We are in the place and you are the place. This is where God is. And we find that very important. Now God's done a lot of things here. You heard about Gilly and uh, the kids in town need P4K and P4T. This is really important to this church, to this community. Awesome fest. Last year, we gave away over 800 bags of candy in the park. That kept kids from going door to door in neighborhoods. It brought them to a place where Christians could surround them in love. We don't flaunt it, but they love it and they learn about God there. So it's a wonderful thing. We do a lot of missions, but we have three primary missions. And the first one is Streetlight USA. Tell you a little story about that. They rescue girls from 11 to 17 who are entrapped in sex slavery. They bring them in. The problem they had is, by law, these kids have to go to school. Now, I can't imagine, but I'm sure some of you can, what an 11-year-old girl who's been a sex slave feels like going to a public school. Most of the time, they run away back to the street. So when we were visiting them, oh, six months ago, I guess, uh, the lady that runs the place said, her name's Sky. she said, if we could just have school here. Well, one of the ladies from the place was there, and even unbeknownst to me, she set up a curriculum, they've got computers, they've got online courses, and the girls no longer have to go out to public school. So that's just one thing that the place has done to change a system 
that was broken. And they are so happy there. The next one is, I got Tom and a group of people this week, or in a week, that are heading up to Indian Bible College to do some construction work. Indian Bible College is 60 years old, but it's been pretty much a flatline ministry. Uh, 20 to 24 kids at the peak, sometimes 10 and 12. This year, due to efforts by the people at Indian Bible College and our support, they had 40 students enroll. All right. Now, they only got room for 36. <laughs> but as Je uh, Jason, the, the president, said, what a wonderful problem to have. It's a blessing. These are Christians that are being raised to go back to the reservations and spread the word of God. This is the way it should be done. Last but not least, we talk a little bit about Timothy House. Got involved in Timothy House. Well, actually, Greg went over there about four years ago. We built a little building there. Actually, it was a roof, no sidewalls. And that was going to be their chapel, and that was going to be their Sunday school meeting room. It has a sign on it, the place. And I thought that was pretty good. And we decided to start talking, and Justice said, hey, I got two acres two and a half acres, actually. And we want to build a building on it someday. And I said, well, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's figure that out. So we started figuring out, and we figured finally that if we built the right building, we could put 120 kids in that building. Got to thinking about it, and I was talking to Justice, and I said, what about water? He said, well, we got a little pond, but it dries up. I can't have 120 kids with no water. That's, that's lifeblood in Africa. Without water, you're in trouble. So we decided we could put a well in. Well, 120 kids have to be fed. So we had a chicken coop on property that we can rebuild and handle 100 chickens. And he says, what we really need is a pig pen. Pigs are big here. We can really do well with pigs. So we had the pig pen. But you got to feed these animals. So we had two greenhouses. This is a vision that God has given the place to build. Now, I got 150 kids already over there in school. 150 wore clothing. Understand when they go to school, they have to walk great distances to this school, this school, and that school. There's no school nearby them. So I thought, well, we got 150. Let's build another building. We'll have 200 room for 240 kids. Man, we'll have it made. Well, three years ago, Justice took his kids and fled because he was afraid the government was going to gun them down. Now, not just the county government, but the government of Kenya came to the place. They came to the first place, the one that uh, we put the lean-to on. And then they came to the four and a half acres. They said, if you build a school on this, we will provide for free all the materials and all the teachers, and you can teach religion three times a day. The government has completely turned around. You understand, we've taken 150 kids that either went to the dump and scavenged for food or stole. We just had a testimony recently of a young kid who mother died at birth. He was a street kid. He said, I almost got killed stealing a chicken. He said, I never in my life knew what love was until I showed up on Justice's porch and he fed me. And I am now in school and God is my savior. This is a miracle that God has put in front of the place. We have a long journey to go. By the way, we have 150 kids and I still have 19 that are not sponsored by this congregation. I've got one man outside the congregation sponsoring 100 of them. So I need those 19 kids to be sponsored at $30 a month. Uh, Give up that Starbucks, give up that fast food or something. Give something up to go back and see Karen and sign up for one of these children. They need it. We are doing miraculous things because God has put them in front of us to do. In a couple of weeks, Justice will be here. Greg and I will be on stage with him for two Sundays in a row. We will be doing house visits during the week so he can talk to people. When we bring our package out to build these buildings, and it's grown to a pretty good number, 
we're not just asking for money, we're asking for influence. We're asking for other people that you know. I, I said this this morning. Talk to the people this morning about it. And by the way, this service is going much smoother <laughs> than the first one went, believe me. We had technical problems. But a man came back and said, I'm from Michigan, I'm here for a couple weeks. Next Sunday I'll be here, give me your information. We have a foundation that can help support this program. That's what happens when we talk about it. We have to share. We don't all have a pocketbook deep enough to do this, but we all have a heart big enough to make it happen. So I pray that you will take this to your heart and take these kids to heart. Uh, we will have pictures, we will have everything of these kids. Uh, right now, Justice doesn't have a computer, but we're going to get him one, and he'll be able to share a lot more stories from these kids. You will not believe the videos and the joy these kids have. It is amazing. And their one meal a day, by the way, isn't very good. So when we have this up and running, they will have a much more balanced diet. But they are so full of joy, it just lifts your heart. So please consider that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, you have blessed the place, the place where you dwell, the hearts that you dwell in, dear Lord. You are God. You are our Father. We are your children, as we said earlier. We're children not by blood, but we're children by the adoption of Jesus Christ and God our Father. You have taken us into your angel wings, and you are protecting us. Now help us do your will, dear Lord, throughout the world, as you have asked us to do. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.